You will be placed into the conference as a listen-only participant. Enjoy your meeting. Just a reminder, today's meeting is being recorded. Good evening. Good evening. This is Dr. Russell Miller from Naval Medical Center San Diego, and along with my co-moderator, Dr. David Shaw from UCLA Harborview, I'm excited to welcome you to the August 2016 installment of the American Association of Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology webinar series. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Sadhu Gangaran and Dr. Adnan Majid from the Department of Thoracic Surgery and Interventional Pulmonology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center here today to discuss bronchoscopic and surgical management of tracheobronchomalacia. Dr. Majid and Dr. Gangaran will begin with formal remarks, but we highly encourage audience participation. Questions can be submitted in the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, and after the presentations are complete, we'll open up to additional questions from the panel. Please place your phones on mute when you're not speaking to avoid feedback. And additionally, I'd like to disclose that the sessions will be recorded for future viewing on the ABIP website. And finally, the contents of this presentation represent the opinions of the speaker and not necessarily the ABIP. So without further ado, Dr. Majid, please begin. Well, first, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Shan, Dr. Miller, as well as the educational committee from the AVIP for the invitation. It's not only a pleasure to be speaking about uh, one of our areas of expertise, but also a great honor to be part of this web webinar. Um, as we were, we've been asked to, to discuss in the next 60 minutes the assessment of this patient as well as the bronchoscopic and surgical approach to this patient population. Uh, unfortunately, many of these patients are currently under-diagnosed and, uh, or misdiagnosed, and this has led to significant morbidity and health healthcare utilization by these patients. Uh, my disclosures, I'm edu an, uh, an educational consultant for Olympus America and uh, Boston Scientific Corporation, I'm, and I'm also a principal investigator in, multi in various uh, industry-sponsored trials but I do not have any conflicts of interest with regards to this presentation. We start with a, 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 an interactive case. Uh, this is a 50-year-old female with recurrent respiratory infections, shortness of breath, inability to clear secretions, and cough. She was diagnosed with asthma 20 years ago and initially re responded to conventional medical therapy with inhaled corticosteroids and bronchodilators, but for the past five years, she has been refractory to maximum medical therapy, including oral corticosteroids. She had a chest X-ray, which was read as normal, and she had also spirometry, a pre and post bronchodilator. We show a normal FEV1, and as well as a normal flow volume loop. So what would be the best next step in the diagnosis and management in the diagnosis of this patient. A bronchoscopy under general anesthesia, immunodeficiency testing, dynamic airway CT, a methacholine challenge, or a GERD evaluation with a pH probe test. So the best answer for this patient, the patient has typical symptoms of tracheobronchomalacia. A dynamic airway CT is a non-invasive, highly sensitive test to diagnose tracheomalacia and correlates very well with the gold standard, which is the dynamic flexible bronchoscopy. 97% correlation. Uh, with regards to the other uh, options, bronchoscopy and the general anesthesia. Uh, and unfortunately, when bronchoscopy is performed under general anesthesia, uh, we can underestimate the degree of airway collapse. We need the patient to cooperate and perform certain maneuvers to elicit that central airway collapse. Immunodeficiency testing, metacholine challenge, and GERD evaluation with the pH probe test are appropriate tests to 
assess for coexisting conditions, but they will not make the diagnosis of tracheobronchomalacia. This patient underwent a dynamic airway CT, and on forced exhalation, you can see there is near complete collapse of her trachea. And as in 2016, we have significant challenges when we deal with patients with either tracheobronchomalacia or excessive dynamic airway collapse. As I mentioned before, it's an under-recognized and un misdiagnosed condition many times. Unfortunately, we don't have a standardized definition or classification. It represents a heterogeneous disease with a diverse symptom profile. Some patients present with dyspnea, others with cough, others with recurrent infections, and others with all of the above. If untreated, has significant morbidity, quality of life implications, and limitations, and increased healthcare utilization. Proposed treatments are invasive, and clinical evidence to support these treatments are based on uncontrolled clinical trials. So our objectives for today is to review the definition and classification, discuss the diagnostic workup, and review with you the evidence behind the use of airway stents, medical therapy, and surgery. And we will finish up with some recommendations. So first, the definition. Central dynamic airway collapse includes both tracheobronchomalacia and excessive dynamic airway collapse. Tracheobronchomalacia is characterized by softening of the airway cartilage with subsequent dynamic collapse of the central airways with exhalation. On the other hand, excessive dynamic airway collapse, you preserve the, the uh, structure of the cartilage, you preserve the C-shaped configuration of the trachea, there is atrophy of the longitudinal, longitudinal fibers in the posterior membranous wall, and with exhalation, this protrusion of the posterior membranous wall into the airway lumen causing obstruction. There are many ways of classifying this entity. You can classify it according to the etiology, to the morphology, to the severity, and some experts have suggested to lump all these classifications into one. If you're going to classify it according to the etiology, it can be classified into primary and secondary. Primary can be found in the pediatric populations, and most of these are congenital, or in the adult population as the idiopathic form or the munier cohn syndrome also known as tracheobronchomegaly. Most commonly, we will find the secondary causes. It can be found after a trauma, either penetrating trauma or surgical trauma in, the, in patients who undergo a lung transplantation, airway resections and reconstructions, or a tracheostomies. Patients with chronic infections may develop tracheobronchomalacia and as such as patients with cystic fibrosis, patients with chronic inflammatory conditions such as COPD, asthma, or relapsing polychondritis, uh, and also uh, patients with a external, with a mediastinal masses, either cysts, abscesses, tumors, or a, a, an, an, an abnormal vascular, uh, vasculature may develop focal areas of malaise, such as in patients with goiters or in patients with aortic aneurysms. We can also classify it according to the severity, and this has changed in the past few years. In the past, we used to say that if the airway, if the cross-sectional area decreased more than 50%, you had tracheomalacia. But we know uh, from the data coming from the radiology literature uh, that if uh, we use 50% of as our cutoff, 78% of normal volunteers will meet the criteria for tracheomalacia. So for that, uh, the, the bar has been raised to 70%. We classify 70 to 80 is mild, 81 to 90 moderate, and more than, greater than 90 is severe. You can also classify it according to the morphology. In the center of the slide, you will see 
in normal airway at FRC. To the right, you will see that there is bulging of the posterior membranous wall, but less than 70%, and that's a normal physiologic dynamic airway collapse. On the left, you can see the EDAC when that threshold is greater than 70%, but the cartilage is preserved. You preserve that C-shaped configuration of the trachea. You cause it excessive dynamic airway collapse. At the top of the slide, you can see a decrease in the AP, in the AP diameter, and also lo you lose that C-shaped configuration. The, the cartilage is now loose, and this is um, described as the crescentic type of tracheomalacia. On the bottom left, when there's a decrease in the lateral diameter, you, this is described as the saber sheet type of tracheomalacia, frequently seen in patients with a COPD. And in the bottom right, you can see when there is decrease in the AP diameter as well as a decrease in the lateral diameter, you have that circumferential type of tracheomalacia, frequently seen in patients with relapsing polychondritis. Here you can see bronchoscopic images of patients. Um, in, the, in the left, A and B, you can see patients with severe COPD with a saber shift type of tracheomalacia. Uh, image C and D, you can see the posterior wall bulging with a decrease in the AP diameter, but preserving that C-shaped configuration of the trachea. Image E, you can appreciate the decrease in the lateral and AP diameters in a patient with relapsing polychondritis, showing that concentric type of tracheomalacia. And in figure F, you can see the, uh, observe the decrease in the AP diameter and, and loss of the C-shaped configuration, typically seen in the crescent type of tracheomalacia. Some experts have advocated lumping all these classifications together into the FEMUS classification and adding a functional assessment. Uh, unfortunately, it, it, this classification is cumbersome and uh, is still missing some co important components when assessing this patient popula population, such as assessing for cough and recurrent infections, which are frequent symptoms in these patients. From a clinical perspective, you'll be surprised, but a, a fair number of patients may have significant dynamic airway collapse, and they may be asymptomatic. Other patients may present with dyspnea, which is the most common symptom. Up to 90% of patients will have dyspnea. Dyspnea can be severe enough to lead leading into respiratory failure. 80% of patients will have cough. Many, many of them have intractable cough, described as a barking seal type of cough. Can, that can lead to syncope. Patients uh, usually complain of inability to clear secretions, leading to mucostasis, and predisposing them to recurrent respiratory infections. If patients have mainly bronchomalacia, they will present with wheezing, if they have tracheomalacia, they may have some degree of strider. And a small percent of patients may present with unexplained extubation failure. Some patients in the ICU had a pneumonia, had respiratory failure, and upon extubation, they failed once their pneumonia cleared, and it's because of that transition into spontaneous breathing. Other patients may undergo a surgical procedure an operation, an elective operation, they are intubated and upon extubation, they are failed to extubate due to changes in tracheal pressure and collapse upon extubation. The differential diagnosis includes other disease entities with the same symptom profile. Shortness of breath, cough, wheezing, and recurrent infections. Many of these patients will start their workup with a chest X-ray. Unfortunately, chest X-rays are not sensitive nor specific and are rarely helpful. They will follow with pulmonary function tests, and although they can provide data to support the diagnosis, they are not diagnostic. And we looked at this a few years ago 
and 90 patients with moderate to severe tracheobronchomalacia. And 44% of these patients will have purely a ventilator, an obstructive ventilatory defect. 18% will have a restrictive defect. 17% will have a mixed. And most importantly, 21%, despite complete or severe collapse of their central airways, they had normal pulmonary function testing. So I think the teaching point here is to remember that a normal pulmonary function test should not dissuade you from pursuing a diagno uh, the, 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 uh, diagnostic workup for tracheobronchomalacia. Uh, <clears throat> regarding the flow volume loops, the most frequent finding was an, a low peak expiratory flow rate, but again, 17% had normal, uh, no distinctive abnormalities in the flow volume loop. If you want to pursue the diagnosis, you can uh, uh, order a dynamic airway CT, or you can go directly to the gold standard, which is a dynamic flexible bronchoscopy. Dynamic flexible bronchoscopy is done under light sedation, usually a combination of a Versed, midazolam, and fentanyl, and topical anesthesia. We use a diagnostic bronchoscope to prevent stenting of the airways while doing the dynamic maneuvers. We introduce the bronchoscope to the proximal trachea. We ask the patient to take a deep breath. We take an image, and then we ask the patient to blow it out hard, and we take an image on a forced exhalation. We repeat the maneuver at the mid distal trachea, right main, left main, and bronchus intermediates. And then we estimate the cross-sectional area. And if, if there is a, in a, de um, a decrease in the cross-sectional area greater than 70%, we have a diagnosis. You can do this also in the dynamic airway CT. As you may see in the slide, you estimate at the end, in, 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 in inspiration, you estimate the cross-sectional area. And then at end, exhal and with dynamic exhalation, you uh, again estimate the cross-sectional area and you uh, calculate the collapsibility index with the formula uh, that you see in the slide. Once you've made a diagnosis, if the patients are asymptomatic, there's no need for treatment, we do recommend a follow-up and a limited workup, basically, basically looking at possible comorbid conditions such as obstructive lung disease and acid reflux disease. If they are symptomatic, we do look for comorbid or coexisting conditions, again, obstructive lung disease, acid reflux disease, as well as vocal cord dysfunction. If they have them, we treat them for at least four to eight weeks. Many of these patients are also deconditioned, so we encourage them to do a pulmonary rehab with some breathing uh, and, and learn some breathing techniques. And if, despite maximal medical therapy, they are still symptomatic in a very selected patient population, we recommend a stent trial. Either, either, for diffuse and for localized disease. And we looked at this a few years ago. We, we, did a, 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 we, we looked at the role of airway stenting in tracheobronchomalacia. We conducted a prospective observational study, and the role of that study was to evaluate the effect of silicon stents in this patient population and the effect on their symptoms. And we looked at Disney scores, uh, with the effect on health-related quality of life, we looked at the St. George Respiratory Questionnaire we, at lung function using the a lung, a pulmonary function test, the FEV1, exercise capacity, a six, uh, we used the six-minute walk test, and we also uh, addressed a performance status using the Karnofsky Performance Scale. We did baseline uh, measurements, and then we compared them to those obtained 10 to 14 days after the stent. We had 75 patients referred to us. Of those, 58 had severe disease and underwent rigid bronchoscopy with stent placement. Mean age of 69, most of them were men, and 79% of patients had obstructive lung disease. Most frequently, the patients had dyspnea, cough, recurrent infections, and 
a minority, but an important percentage had respiratory failure. Seventy-seven percent of these patients reported improvement of their symptoms after the stent was placed. Our outcome measures, a patient showed when there was a, there was a clinical and a statistical improvement in their health-related quality of life. There was clinical and statistical, uh, uh, the, there was improvement in the dyspnea, not only clinical, but also statistically uh, relevant. There was improvement in their performance status. This was, again, clinically relevant as well as statistically significant. There was improvement in the six-minute walk test, but this did not reach statistical significance, and there was no change in the uh, lung function test as measured by FEV1. Unfortunately, there were significant uh, stent-related complications, most commonly obstruction due to mucus plugging, infection, migration, and cough. So we concluded that airway stabilization uh, with airway stents in patients with tracheobronchomalacia improved respiratory symptoms, quality of life, and functional status. But this was associated with significant stent-related complications. So at that point, we said, how can we decrease these complications? So we thought initially we used to place tubular stents in these place, in patients, one in the trachea, one in the left, and one in the right. But the, the, the stents migrated and plugged frequently. So in order to prevent migration, we changed our protocol. We started placing wide silicone stents. And it also started implementing a standardized protocol uh, made by mucolytic and an expectorant to prevent mucus plugging and hopefully uh, decrease the rate of superinfection. Uh, super so we conducted a, a prospective observational study and we, com uh, we recorded the complication rate and compared both groups, the group that had the standardized protocol and the group that did not have the standardized protocol. And as you may see, there was a de significant decrease in the rate of complications in the group that uh, followed the standardized protocol. As you saw from our core, uh, cohort, 60% of patients have COPD. So we also wanted to look at this patient population and see how they perform when we perform airway stabilization, either in the form of stenting or tracheobronchoplasty. And we saw that patients uh, with severe, moderate to severe tracheobronchomalacia and moderate to severe COPD that underwent central airway stabilization had improvements in their health-related quality of life, dyspnea scores, and performance status. And this was not only clinical, but statistically significant, except in the, uh, in the performance scale in this 10 group. This, we also, um, not, uh, we also showed that there was clinical improvement in the FEV1 and in the six-minute walk test, but unfortunately, this did not reach a statistical significance. So we concluded that central airway stabilization, either by stenting or surgery, may provide symptomatic benefit to patients with severe COPD and tracheobronchomalacia. But there is no doubt that surgical cent uh, central airway stabilization via tracheobronchoplasty provided the greatest advantage. So, unfortunately, many patients due to comorbid conditions, even if they have a positive stent trial, they cannot have surgery. Other patients um, do not tolerate long-term stenting. So what can we do for this patient population? So for this patient population, what we do is uh, we treat them symptomatic using non-invasive uh, ventilation in a CPAP or BiPAP, usually at night and on as needed basis when they feel like they have this choking sensation or choking episodes. For patients that have a, a difficulty clearing secretions, we use a combination of an expector and a, and a mucolytic uh, in addition to a mechanical device, either a flutter valve, a calpella, or a vest. For patients that cough is their main symptoms, we use antitoxic medication. And patients that are heavily deconditioned, which is the vast majority, we 
send them to pulmonary rehab where they do regular pulmonary rehab, but sometimes they do pulmonary rehab with CPAP. And also we encourage them to use, uh, to practice some breathing techniques such as the first lead breathing technique. So just to finish up, uh, our protocol here at BIDMC, when patients are referred for, or with uh, possible tracheomalacia, we make, we proceed to confirm the diagnosis with either with a dynamic CT and or a dynamic flexible bronchoscopy. Once we made the diagnosis, we look for comorbid conditions, either asthma or COPD, GERD, vocal cord dysfunction, and some, we look also for immunodeficiency states. If uh, we treat the comorbid conditions and they are still symptomatic and they have severe central collapse, we do a stent trial. If they improve, we uh, refer them towards surgery. If they are surgical candidates, they undergo surgery. If they are not surgical candidates, then either we keep the stent chronically or we treat them medically. So to conclude, we can say TBM is a heterogeneous disease with diverse symptom profile. Patients with TBM have non-specific symptoms that frequently overlap those of more prevalent diseases, diseases such as COPD and asthma, which leads to underdiagnosis or misdiagnosis. Central airway stabilization with white silicon stains, stents improve symptoms, quality of life, and functional status, but they are associated with high rate of complications. And in 2016, their, their role is mainly limited to help identify patients who may benefit from tracheobronchoplasty. So with that, I conclude, and I will hand the, hand the speaker to Dr. Gangadhar. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so I'm Sadhu Gingadar, I'm one of the uh, thoracic surgeons here. I work very closely with Dr. Majid and uh, the interventional pulmonary team, uh, and it's a very close collaboration that allows us to uh, take care of these patients, both from the time of el evaluation to eventual treatments. So I'm going to talk about the surgery uh, that we do for tracheobronchomalacia, and <clears throat> I don't have any disclosures. Uh, just to go on the decision whether somebody is a surgical candidate, I think you can think about this decision algorithm, which involves setting a threshold for surgery. And things that can move the threshold one way or another would be if your uh, surgical outcomes were somehow improved because of technique, you could decrease your threshold for making a decision to do surgery. If you don't have a good response to the stent, then that should raise your threshold to go to surgery. Uh, if the patient has a lot of comorbidities, it should raise your threshold to go to surgery. And clearly, the severity of disease needs to be up here uh, in order to uh, exceed that uh, threshold for a decision to go to surgery. So these are the things that we consider here. Um, the benefit versus the harm of the surgery, are there competing solutions? We need to do hypothesis testing, which is the response to the stent. And then we have to consider what our uh, surgical morbidity and efficacy uh, look like. Now, just to go back in time, glomectomy was an operation that was, uh, was done uh, back in the early 60s. It was popularized actually by a surgeon that was at our institution, Richard Overholt, and he did thousands of these uh, cases where they removed the carotid body uh, to help with asthma. And here's one of their earlier papers that showed uh, in a very short period of time follow-up some very excellent results. And, uh, very quickly, this, this caught on with a small number of thoracic surgeons, and they were doing hundreds, if not thousands, of these cases. And then about the mid-60s, people started thinking, you know, that just doesn't make sense. And here's a report in uh, New England Journal saying uh, that it really doesn't work for uh, asthma. And this actually was a sham controlled trial of glomectomy versus a sham control, and there was really no difference. And pretty soon, uh, it got to this point where most thoracic surgeons, when surveyed, really decided that glomectomy, uh, a surgical procedure for symptom relief, actually had no place whatsoever. And if you look in this uh, article very closely in JAMA, the great discrepancy between results reported by proponents of the technique and the more skeptical surgeons might be due to the emotional factors in the patients. The initial benefit seen in some patients may have an emotional rather than a physiological basis. So 
I think about that quite a lot when I make a decision to take somebody for a tracheal bronchoplasty. Clearly, these are patients that are suffering, and they would like to have a solution to their suffering. And because of that, I think the placebo effect can loom very large. And that's why I can't underscore enough the importance of hypothesis testing and finding out truly what the response to the stent is. So when I talk to patients, I would like to see that they have a night and day difference uh, with the stent in place. And even that is not an infallible way to assess them because people obviously know that we put the stent in to see if they're a candidate for surgery, so they want to, uh, to do well. But uh, as best we can, we really try to use that stent as a way to understand whether surgical central airway stabilization will, in fact, help. The uh, technique that we used was uh, initially described by Herzog and Nissen in the 50s and involved bone, uh, which you can see sutured on here to the back wall of the uh, airway. That's subsequently been modified. So um, both types of malacia, either where the cartilage has been uh, blasted out and you have a very wide attenuated uh, airway, or if it's a primarily uh, EDAC situation, um, both of those can, sorry, respond very well uh, to this type of surgical stabilization. The type of uh, anatomy that does not respond well to this is a concentric uh, narrowing because really you're dealing with a posterior process here with the surgery. So I'm going to go through the steps of the operation starting from the airway management. We work through the right thoracotomy and we like to decrease the bulk of the endotracheal tube or endobronchial tube within the lumen so we actually shave down the endobronchial tube uh, and then the next step is to dissect the airway. So, uh, Russell, if you don't mind going to uh, the uh, movie at uh, 55 seconds, please. And this is from a presentation that we gave at the AATS uh, just a few months ago. And here we're dissecting uh, through the right thoracotomy. In a second, the uh, labels will come up so you can see the anatomy superior is to the top of the screen, inferior to the bottom left, anterior and posterior. And that's the azagous vein that we eventually will, uh, in fact, divide. Here we're dissecting on the back wall of the airway. Uh, the vagus nerve is, uh, is seen coursing over the back wall of the airway. And here you can see uh, the posterior uh, wall of the airway coming into uh, view. Right now we're working on the left main stem bronchus and from the right thoracotomy approach we can really get uh, very nice exposure of the entirety of the thoracic trachea, obviously the right sided airways and then the left main stem bronchus. Okay, we can go back to the uh, presentation, please. And we'll go to the next slide. So the next uh, step that we take is uh, we have to get a sense of exactly how we will uh, uh, size the mesh uh, and in order to do that, we take measurements which are sort of standardized to the same measurement areas that we do both on the dynamic uh, airway CT scan as well as the functional bronchoscopy. So uh, back to the video, please, at uh, uh, 1 minute and 24 seconds. And we'll just play 10 seconds of this. Fast forward to 124. Sorry, is this where you want us to be? Uh, 124. Uh, that was a little bit back. I apologize. I think the time okay. is off. It's 212 right now. Uh, this is uh, Tell me to fast forward a little. 
we could fast forward about uh, 30 seconds from here, if you don't mind. So here we're taking measurements of the uh, the trachea, and we try to get from the cartilaginous spur to the cartilaginous spur <clears throat> without uh, too much stretching of the uh, airway, both proximally and distally here on the trachea. And then we'll take similar measurements of the right main stem bronchus, the bronchus intermedius, and then the left main stem bronchus. And I think rather than switch back to the uh, the PowerPoint, if we could fast forward to two minutes and 45 seconds, please. Oh, apologize. This is, uh, I think the timing's a little off. This has us at 4.35 right now. Okay. This is uh, actually perfect. So here is the polypropylene mesh, and based on the measurements that we took on the, um, on the airway, I've uh, calculated the size that we ought to make this mesh. And then you can see we're taking the measurements here of the uh, tracheal limb the right main stem and bronchus intermediate limb, and now we're uh, sketching out the left main stem bronchus limb. Um, after that, we just cut this mesh into uh, place, leaving a little bit of an edge uh, on the side of the uh, mesh so that the sutures don't pull through that uh, very edge. And even if we measure it at this size during the conduct of the operation, uh, there are often very minute adjustments that are made to uh, really size the airway appropriately. Here we've gone through the mesh and now we're taking our sutures through the actual back of the airway. This is the uh, first suture which is going through and through the cartilage. Uh, so we're getting a partial thickness by We try to stay out of the lumen of the airway uh, completely. Now we're taking uh, a uh, pass through the membrane, and you can see it's a little bit of a floppy membrane, even uh, just with the minor manipulation you can see with the forceps. The next bite is again through the membrane. And then for this next suture pass, we really need to feel that cartilage on the other side, and sometimes that can be difficult with the endo bronchial tube in place, we have to be absolutely sure that we see cartilage and we're not just suturing where the edge of that tube is. And this will complete our, our fourth uh, suture. So typically we make rows of four unless the airway becomes very small like sometimes it does at the distal bronchus intermedius. What, we, what you don't see here is that the mesh is holding all of these sutures. So we've gone across the mesh in the, in the appropriate location. And I think if we could fast forward about 10 seconds from here. Now we have sutured the trachea, the right main stem, and the left main stem. And there are about 13 to 14 sutures in place. And now we're going to bring that mesh down onto the back of the airway. Here's the mesh coming down. And if we made the sizing correctly, this mesh will sit down on the back of that airway nice and taut. And here you can see we've tied all those sutures down. The mesh is now anchored to the airway, and we're suturing the next row on the trachea. And we'll work from distal to proximal on that trachea until we get all the way up to the thoracic inlet. This is some excess mesh. We uh, tend to leave it long until we know we don't need it. And you can see that now, that little last little bit, we don't suture it into place, but we'll tuck it up into the uh, part of the trachea that's leading up into the neck. And you can see here the, uh, the plasty in place. Now we're doing the left main stem bronchus. So I think we can stop the video and go back to the uh, slideshow, please.
and then if I could get controls again of the slideshow. Thank you. Okay, so we'll fast forward through this. Uh, this is what we just saw in the video and uh, completed, uh, the completed plasty approximately distally. The crine is just under here. This is the left main stem, right main stem is underneath that sponge. So what we do is use that uh, mesh to sort of create a little bit of tension on the back wall of the airway. I sort of think about this like pulling on a bowstring. And typically, these are the amounts of downsizing that we actually see. So in the trachea, about 30%, uh, a little bit more in the distal trachea and so forth, and the bronchus intermedius, right main stem bronchus, and left main stem bronchus. And if you look at the distribution of downsizing, I mean, how much do we shrink down the mesh in comparison to the native airway dimension? Basically, the bigger the transverse diameter of the native airway, the more we cinch that down. And, and what you might notice here is that some of the airways that we're operating on are four and five centimeters wide. These are massively abnormal airways. Some of them are not. Some of them are in the one to two, two and a half centimeter uh, range. And we see that similar pattern. The larger the airway, the more we can cinch it down. The smaller the airway, the closer we have to leave it at its uh, uh, native dimension. We've made a couple technical modifications here. I uh, now bunched the sutures on the mesh a little bit differently so they end up looking like this rather than spacing them evenly. I think that takes out some of the redundancy in the membrane. And these are the outcomes we didn't see. We've not seen a difference in our FEV1s, uh, either with stenting or with surgery. But six minute walk distances, sorry, the uh, dyspnea scores, St. George respiratory questionnaire, uh, the BDI, TDIs, all these have improved after surgery. Now, the data that I just showed you are the 30 days, so the short-term data, and this was published based on a 64-patient series uh, a few years ago. The morbidity, not surprisingly, uh, is most uh, concentrated with respiratory problems. Uh, there uh, is a very low mortality rate uh, and a smattering of other complications you can see there. Um, we have had the tracheostomy rate as high as 11%, although that was uh, primarily seen in the initial uh, part of our series, and we don't uh, tend to do prophylactic tracheostomies on patients anymore. 30% uh, of them in this initial series were done at the time of the operation. The length of stay is eight days. Patients typically stay about three days in the ICU, but even with this arduous operation and recovery, we have nearly 75% of the patients going home and only a quarter of them going to rehab. So this is a patient that had inspiratory and expiratory films. These are prior to the tracheoplasty. Here's in the trachea, uh, approximately now distally. You can see a fair amount of collapse. Uh, the right main stem bronchus, the bronchus intermedius, and the left main stem. So this patient had severe, diffuse, acquired tracheobronchomalacia. And then if we could just play just a snip of the uh, second movie there, please. And these patients we bring back for a standard two-week post-op check and then three-month post-op check. And at that time, we repeat uh, their testing. And we also uh, perform another CT scan and bronchoscopy. So this is the patient's bronchoscopy after the tracheobronchoplasty, same patient that you saw with near complete collapse. And uh, you can't hear the audio, but uh, she's being exhorted to uh, breathe out very hard. And you can see slight bowing on that posterior membrane, but nothing like the collapse that we saw uh, on those still pictures. Okay, back to the PowerPoint, please. So these patients, as you saw from Dr. Mejia's presentation, uh, often come with comorbidities. And one of the concerns that we had was how durable is this uh, repair? Are they going to have um, uh, symptoms come back simply because of progression either of this disease or otherwise? So very recently we have uh, completed a longer term uh, study uh, looking at our patients up to the year 2015. This was 100 patients uh, who had undergone a tracheobronchoplasty looking at these data points. Uh, the short-term complications are similar, high number of patients with respiratory complications. Still, the, uh, the mortality rate very low, now 2%, really the first uh, 
the only debts we had were in the very beginning part of the series, actually. Uh, but here now we're looking at the long-term complications. There are patients that have chronic pain from the thoracotomy. Uh, we have seen mesh erosion, which is a concern that we have using a permanent type of mesh that was in three patients, uh, and then uh, dysphagia, pleural fusions, lung herniation. Now, you can see in these numbers that the, there's, there's a considerable drop-off on the uh, uh, proportion of patients that have been followed all through five years. But starting with 90, we reported, uh, they've self-reported improvement uh, in the vast majority, so nearly 80% of the patients. And even at five years, the 20% that, or the 20 or 20% 20 uh, that we still were able to get data points on, uh, still 65% of them reported improvement. Now, granted, this uh, is certainly subject to selection bias because these may be the patients that are happy to come back and see us. Uh, similarly, for airway patency, meaning uh, maintenance of the airway so that it did not collapse back to the level of the collapse prior to the trachobronchoplasty uh, in, again, about 20% uh, of the patients, even going out to five years, we've uh, maintained patency of the uh, airway. And here's some pictures of the patient pre-op with the collapse on CT and bronchoscopy, and then post-op two years after a very nice uh, result. We've made some technical modifications. There are some other modifications that we are looking at uh, now with both regard to uh, splint material, other medications that might be able to cause some uh, fibrosis, uh, adhesive rather than suturing, which could decrease the time of the operation. So in, in conclusion, the optimal treatment of TBM, I think it's clear that if you do not have severe disease, you shouldn't operate on these patients. You should try to ca uh, establish causation in the sense that patients might have trachobronchomalacia, which is not actually leading to their symptoms, and the stent trial uh, hopefully can help uh, tease that out. But tracheobronchoplasty is a good operation for patients that meet these criteria. And even long-term improvement may be achieved, but you have to watch these patients very closely because we didn't talk about it here because of time, but patients can have progression or recurrence, and you can have progression in areas that weren't plastied, uh, such as the cervical trachea, and there are some options. Uh, for us to be able to deal with that. So, again, I thank you for the privilege to, uh, to participate in this webinar, and I think now we are going to open up the floor for uh, questions. Thank you both. That was a really an excellent talk. So, um, what I would like to do is, if anybody has a question, could you please type it into the chat box um, in the bottom left-hand corner, and then I can unmute you and you could ask the question. Um, while we're um, waiting for a question, I just uh, had one. So the crossover between EDAC and true uh, tracheomalacia can be difficult. And how often do you see patients that seem like they'd likely be a surgical candidate, a stent candidate, that with um, really aggressive COPD management, um, have resolution to the point where they're no longer really the patient you thought they were? Yeah, the, it's important to highlight the, the how, how aggressive we need to work up these patients and how aggressive we need to treat the coexisting conditions. There is, um, the first thing we do is we look at the coexisting conditions, treat them aggressively, and then reassess uh, because may, many of these patients uh, 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 will improve with only medical therapy. And again, it's not only uh, obstructive lung disease. Many of these patients have also significant acid reflux disease, and just by treating their uh, coexisting condition, their symptoms improve, and you don't have to uh, intervene in their airways. I think the, uh, and I think that's a great point. We certainly do not offer the operation to patients that have another alternative. Uh, there are patients, though, that have come in with uh, severe COPD with FEV1 that are down in the sub-40% uh, predicted range that have been maximized on their uh, medical therapy uh, who get a stent. Uh, these patients often have a primarily EDAC form of collapse and um, we have had some patients, albeit with an arduous hospital course, uh, do very, very well. Um, and I think the interesting thing in those patients is that it may not be a long-standing win 
but it might gain them two, three, four years of market improvement in their functionality with regard to dyspnea uh, before they start degrading again, not because of the malacia, but because of their uh, lung disease. So we have a question from Mel Imad. I'm going to unmute uh, him or her real quick so they can ask the question. Are you there? Yes. Um, hello? Mel? Yes. Yeah. Hello? Uh, hello, your question? Yeah, hey, thanks for okay. the present. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, thanks for this presentation. Um, so we're faced with this in, in private practice often and, and uh, um, with patients that have no other options and they're not surgical candidates and, um, you know, to undergo, uh, I'm, I'm just wanting to see how often do you still do uh, stent long-term in, in patients without any other option who are not surgical candidates and they fail um, medical therapy and they're still um, basically miserable. So uh, is, that, is that something you do often and how often if you do that or uh, how, how do you uh, manage so, those patients? So nowadays we are doing that less frequently. When we started the program, mm -hmm. basically we, the patient had a severe trichomalacia, they were symptomatic and they were not surgical candidates and they responded initially to the stent. We used to use stents more frequently, but what we learned is that this patient had frequent complications from the stent. And, um, and as I uh, showed in my presentation, we have some control of, all, of some of the complications. Migration, we changed the, the, the shape of the stent. Mucus plugging, we um, treat them with a mucolytic and an expectorant and a, 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 a mechanical device. But there is a complication. Granulation tissue formation is something that we don't have control over it. And many of these patients within weeks of the stent being placed will develop, will develop granulation tissue and subsequent obstruction, uh, airway obstruction. So they, uh, and that's, I would say, 80% of patients will have those complications uh, within weeks. Um, so our first step is to treat them medically, uh, a combination of a CPAP, non-invasive ventilation, uh, at night on a as-needed basis, the combination of an expectorant and a mucolytic, a pulmonary rehab, including BiPAP during pulmonary rehab, personally breathing maneuvers, and, uh, and with that, actually, some patients, uh, we keep them because uh, in, uh, those patients uh, mostly complain or of uh, recurrent respiratory infections, and by decreasing the infections, you increase the bronchospasm, and and the, the their symptoms has have improved. Um, so we we limit long term uh, stents as much as we can. Although we have one or two patients out there with chronic stents, but that's the uh, an exception rather than a rule. Okay. Okay, well, thanks okay. a lot. And and I have, if you don't, I don't know if there's another question, but I, I have a couple other questions uh, while I'm on the line. We have, we, I'll leave you unmuted, but there's a couple other questions. Um, I'm going to go to Ismail Matas real quickly. Um, and um, Sure. You are muted now. Sure. Ismail? Hello? Okay, so I'm just going to read his question uh, if, he, if we can't hear him. He asked, um, there's been some smaller rec uh, recent studies um, using heat therapy such as APC or laser um, for the treatment of the posterior membrane causing scarring and stiffening with reported improvements in the quality of life. Have you, do you have any thoughts on that? So <clears throat> I can... Uh... I can comment. I, I seen those uh, reports as well, and I think they're they're certainly promising. And I think an endoscopic approach to the patients that have structural integrity of their cartilage makes a lot of sense. Whether it's uh, you know an injectable uh, 
growth factor or something that's going to create fibrosis or even just a mechanically uh, created fibrosis like you get with the laser. Um, you know, the, I think the issue in my mind is that these patients have a process that causes remodeling. And that process has not been elucidated. And whatever you do to them to cause things to stiffen up could potentially be undone by ongoing process of remodeling. So I, I, I'd be interested to see what the, the longer term outcomes uh, for those endoscopic, non-prosthetic based um, solutions are. Because I, my suspicion is that many of those patients will go on to remodel back to a very collapsible airway, just because we've seen it before. And the, the uh, I guess the example that I would use is the cervical malacia patients. So we don't operate on the majority of patients that have a little mild cervical malacia, but there have been uh, a good handful of our patients that have had disease progress to the cervical trachea. And previously, our solution for that was to do a tracheal resection or reconstruction. So we would take out uh, a bit of cartilage, but a little bit more membrane, and then pull it together in a taut way. And it, at the end of the operation, looks completely taut. And over time, that remodels. And many of those patients get back to the same level of floppiness uh, over time. So I, I would be concerned that a, an endoscopic uh, technique might not give us the, uh, the longstanding uh, results that we'd like at this point. And I have some comments as well. I, I'm, I'm, I think there, there is a potential role for this endoscopic technique in the focal malaise. I think for the diffuse type, I think the, uh, the role is probably limited. Uh, I do have some concerns about safety, and I think some research in the animal lab should proceed uh, uh, before we use it in uh, this patient population. Uh, Adnan, can I, yes. this is Mel, still on the line. Can I just, it's, one of my questions was along those lines, actually. And, can I ask uh, for one one thing that occurred to my mind, and, and I looked it up, but I don't see any application to it, and I don't know if it's feasible or not. Is we do talk, you know, uh, we do bronchial thermoplasty for asthmatic patients, and it's based on remodeling their airways, although it's not necessarily the same targets we're remodeling. But we, we do it, uh, you know, for not just focal. We do it for, you know, for asthma was diffuse. And I, I wasn't sure if it's ever been looked at on an either uh, of, or, or what, what are your thoughts, even though it's, it's a very kind of wild uh, uh, idea. But I, I wasn't, uh, you know, is there any thoughts that you have on possible bronchial thermoplasty and tracheobronchial malaria? That's a good thought. I like the idea of a radio frequency ablation. I think it's a good. I think maybe the, the amount of energy that needs to be delivered needs to be increased to, re, the, uh, to generate a fibrotic reaction. But again, I think we'll have to go to the animal lab first before we take this to the, to the patients to uh, identify what's the level of energy that needs to be administered to, for a desired uh, effect without uh, undesir undesirable complications. So I do think there's a, a potential role for endoscopic techniques in the future, but we need to look at them closer. So we have a, we have, we have a bunch of questions, um, and if uh, Dr. Majid and Dr. Gongran are okay with staying a few extra minutes, but our recording stops at one hour, so I'm going to stop recording, but we'll continue the webinar as long as uh, they're available.